Molly Michaelmas and Her Steam Shovel At the end of September, back in 71, the steam riverboat Meridian Blade caught fire and burned the waterline as she was coming into the docks at St. Meridian. The flames killed everyone on board, and most of those as jumped into the water, before she could be pushed and tugged against the quay in the dark. When dawn revealed the wreck, all that was left was the iron hull, the engine's boiler and iron walking gear at the stern, and a baby girl, swaddled in layers of charred blankets and shoved up in the crook of the bow. Her parents must have been among the dead, since no one claimed her, so she was disposed of along with the other leftovers of the disaster. The hull was broken up and sold for scrap, with the understanding that it was cursed and was never to be used in any other boat's hull. The steam engine was cleaned and crated and stored away, for it was a fine, well-made piece of machinery, but not for use in another steamboat. The baby girl went to the orphanage run by the Sisters of the Immaculate Conception in the dockside neighborhood of St. Meridian. The nuns called her Molly, since she was obviously a child of Ireland at distant remove. She had flame-red hair and wide green eyes and skin like milk that freckled across her nose the moment the sun first touched her. And they called her Michaelmas for the day that she came to them. There were few families willing to take the little orphan into their homes. There were not many Irish in St. Meridian in those days, and most high-toned folk had a low opinion of that race. Folk of the lesser classes had qualms about the girl's provenance, not her pedigree. After all, if a piece of iron could be cursed and a steam plant could acquire a shady reputation— how much more powerful Aegeus could attach itself to a girl who lived when all around her died. The good sisters tried to place her with families a half a dozen times, but she was always back in her bed at the orphanage in a few days. She had a temper to go with her red hair, and was no decorative Irish rose. Truth to tell, she was something of a tomboy and the nuns discerned early on that she had no calling to be a bride of Christ, or of any man. So when Molly turned eighteen, the sisters of the Immaculate Conception gently urged Molly out the door of their orphanage, and breathed a sisterly sigh of relief when she turned the corner. Molly might have found work as a housemaid or something sadder, but she was broader of shoulder than of hip, stocky rather than slender, and strong from fighting with prospective foster mothers, nuns, and the other orphans. She found work fetching and carrying at the construction sites around blooming St. Meridian. And if a construction boss or a lad working alongside her thought she was available for sport instead of labor, a blackened eye or a green stick fracture soon persuaded him otherwise. She changed jobs often, but that meant that in a year every foreman in St. Meridian knew the Irish girl, knew that she could do as much work as any man, and could trust that she would show up sober come Monday morning. She rose to gang boss to foreman herself, and then started her own company, Michaelmas Construction. And no one asked the red-headed woman in the front office where the boss man was. When the jobs got big enough, she looked for a new-fangled steam shovel. The Bellerophon Steam Excavating and Erection Company declined to sell their fine equipment to her, so she built her own. Some of her machine was of the steel beams and angles that went into the skyscraping buildings changing the city's skyline. The treads and drivers were salvaged from a Bellerophon steam shovel that had dug its snout too deeply into the heavy dark river clay and ruptured itself. The steam boiler and walking beams she found stored away in a warehouse. Meridian Blade was engraved above the coal hatch on the boiler's end cap, and Blade is what she called the homemade shovel when it was finished. Office boys and apprentice engineers from the Bellerophon Steam Excavating and Erection Company came and stood outside the palings around the construction sites where Molly gouged out basements and ramps with her shovel and took notes. Now about this time, 
the city of St. Meridian was looking to build a new city hall, and they had a most imposing location picked out for it. Meridian Hill, the only hill of any altitude and substance between the sea and the bluffs at Baton Jean. A mayor and council installed in a civic citadel atop that rise could look out and clearly see all of their domain. Very imposing, but not very practical. Very inconvenient for members of the public having business with their governors to climb. Requiring its own water tower just to get the plumbing to work. And from an engineering standpoint, well, problematic. Consensus among the geographers and geologists on the faculty of St. Meridian University was that Meridian Hill was not a natural hill at all, but a mound raised by some forgotten Indian nation. Lacking a stony heart, it was possibly too unstable for any substantial edifice to be built upon it. And no one among the civil engineering community mentioned that the deepest soundings into the body of the hills seemed to show a void— because that was just silly. Since the first round of requests for proposals had gone out, seven of the most respectable construction firms in St. Meridian had made detailed bids, begun preliminary work on the summit, and packed up their stakes in theodolites, sometimes within days, and respectfully withdrawn their bids. The resulting six-month delay in even getting a basement dug for the much-anticipated new seat of government was becoming a topic of conversation, and was in some danger of becoming an object of derision, which might metastasize into the reason certain politicians got tossed out of office. Horrors! Something had to be done. So when the irregular and unorthodox and previously disregarded proprietess of the Michaelmas Construction Company put in a bid, it was credibly considered. And when she sweetened the deal by offering to get the basement dug in a single day, it was accepted. Molly had her campaign planned out before ever she put in a bid. Over the following weekend, her men drove in stakes and strung guidelines to outline the basement of the incipient city hall. And before sunup on Monday, Michaelmas, the feast of St. Michael, God's general and dragon slayer, she was there to stoke the shovel spoiler and bring her own iron dragon to life and begin the work. In the dark. Alone. Well, almost alone. We know these things happened because an old bum, maybe one of General Sherman's original bummers, maybe not, had spent the night huddled against the boards of the palisade that surrounded the site, staying out of the September night breeze. So Molly was hard at work as her crew appeared one by one. She forged ahead and downward as they discarded stakes and markers that teetered at the raw straight sides of the growing pit. A crowd of the idle public and representatives of the city government showed up as the day wore on. The sun rose, then declined to the horizon, and Molly was just starting on the last level of spoil to be removed from the bottom of the excavation when a gush of black vapor burst from the ground with a volcanic howl spreading an impenetrable pall over the summit of Meridian Hill. Spectators, workmen, and civic dignitaries all fled the summit, the unearthly screaming jet, and a stench like leviathan rotting. All, all except the bum, who may have been too astonished to feel a decent urge to self-preservation, or may have been too drunk to run, having spent the day cadging nickels and drinks from the crowd. Brave man or souse, we are lucky to have his testament as to what happened next. What happened to Molly Michaelmas? As he told it, Molly was leaning halfway out of Blade's cab, trying to see through the gusher of black fog when the first enormous tentacle snaked out of the pit and wrapped itself around the steam shovel's boom and started to pull. He heard her shout, though he refused for modesty's sake to say exactly what she shouted, as she swung back into the cab and brought the shovel's dipper down on an unseen—it might have been a head— 
He described, as if describing a battle of dinosaurs, how she chewed off a snake's nest of waving tentacles between blades, dipper, and tongue until her unseen monstrous adversary retreated back into the depths. And then, voice quavering, he told how Molly Michaelmas shouted and sang the hymns the nuns had taught her as she dug a ramp in the earth and followed the horror down into its lair until a new and supremely malodorous jet of loathsome vapor drove him, choking, down the side of Meridian Hill and into the arms of the multitude who had fled in terror at the beginning of the fight. The city of St. Meridian police stood in a ring around the bottom of the hill all that night, unfamiliar crag rifles in their hands and bayonets pointed toward the summit. The black and stinking fog gradually drifted off down river, and the stars, for there was no moon that night, shone down. From the bottom of the hill, not even the keenest ear could hear any sound, and no one was brave enough to go climbing up for a closer listen. When dawn broke, a consortium of all the city's construction contractors, save Michael Miss Construction, drove a fleet of steam shovels, brought up during the night, to the summit, and began restoring the spoil Molly had spent the previous long day digging out back into the massive hole. They did not peer long into the void before they began filling it. The offices of Michaelmas Construction are no longer to be found in St. Meridian. The new city hall was built elsewhere. Savants at the university ask themselves why. Knowing that the old people had gone to enormous trouble to build a hill, they, meaning the professors, had never considered that they, meaning the old people, might have been trying to bury something. Something awful. Deep. And Meridian Hill, sometimes called Michaelmas Hill or even Molly's Hill, is preserved as a pristine, if rather steep-sided, city park. Couples picnic and children play upon its slopes. But if you will climb to the summit on a quiet summer afternoon and lay full length on the ground and press your ear to the earth, they say you can hear the clank and grind and roar of an old-fashioned coal-fired steam engine. Digging, still digging, digging yet, digging forever.